you would, go ahead and turn over to Acts chapter 17. That's going to be our passage for this morning. I grew up here at Graceway. Um, my, I am the son of my favorite pastor on staff, which is Marco Castro. And I want to tell a little story about growing up here. When I graduated high school, I stayed in town. I went uh, here in town to UMKC uh, for my degree, go Roos. And it was a very difficult transition for me to make because, it, see, in high school, I had all my friends around me. I had, a, you know, all my youth group buddies. We all loved God. We did stuff together. It was, it was our clique. And then when I got to college, all of that was ripped from me. Three or four of my friends walked away from God, and the other ones went off to different universities, and I'm at UMKC completely alone. And God used that time in my life to really recalibrate me in the, in the area of evangelism. Because, see, in high school, I was that guy that brought his Bible to class, that made sure that you saw and took any and every opportunity to try and shove the gospel down your throat anytime you said anything close to Bible, Jesus, or God. And that's just what I thought boldness was. That's just what I thought my duty here was. And what I learned through college was all my attempts to share the gospel with people really didn't work. And as I lived through that, five years later, I looked behind me, and the two guys that weren't even in my circle of ministry influence were the two guys that came to Christ. And they weren't the guys that were coming to my Bible study or that I was on the street witnessing to or walking around the lunchroom giving tracts to people and trying to drum up spiritual conversations. It wasn't those. It was the guys who I studied with day in and day out. And God used this passage in Acts chapter 17 to reformat my brain when it came to the whole issue of evangelism. And in Acts chapter 17, we're going to start in verse 16, but you guys are currently going through the book of Luke. And that's your only Gentile author in the Bible. He wrote a second book called Acts. A lot of times when you study it, you study Luke-Acts. And so Luke continues to chronicle after Jesus raises from the dead, after Jesus gives the Great Commission, after Jesus empowers his disciples to go out. You have the book of Acts, which is the beginning of the church, and the apostles are going out and going on missionary journeys and sharing the faith. So the church is beginning to grow, and Paul is with Silas and Timothy in Acts chapter 17, and they're in Berea, and they're preaching the gospel, and everybody's excited, and people are coming to Christ, and the work is happening, and everything's kosher and cool, and then some people find out about it, and they're not so happy about it. The traditionalist Jews that don't want anything to do with Jesus or these new, these new doctrines about him being the Messiah. So they send people into Berea, and they start acting violently. And they have to, it was so violent that they had to sneak Paul out. And Silas and Timothy stayed back. And Paul goes to Athens in Greece. And he's sitting at Athens and he's waiting for Paul, or he's waiting for Timothy and Silas to show up. Verse 16. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him and he saw the whole city given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. Verse 21, For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but to either tell or to hear of some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by, I beheld your devotions. I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things." And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. And has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. That they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him. And though 
he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought to think that the Godhead is like unto gold. We ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. Let's pray. Dear God, we just, we love you. <clears throat> Father, we, such an awesome experience to come together as believers, Father, and just worship you because of how mighty and powerful you are. And God, just to watch the healing take place, Lord, as your Holy Spirit moves within us. And God, salvation is happening. Father, you are at work. And Lord, we just pray this morning that your word would go forth, Father, that we would learn, that we would understand, that you would use us for your great commission as better tools in the world that we live in. In your name, amen. The question that I want to ask this morning is, are we, in fact, communicating the gospel? Is that what we're really doing? Because, see, what I had to learn going through college was I really wasn't concerned about communicating the gospel. I was more concerned with articulating the gospel. I was more concerned with trying to be hardcore so I could have these awesome stories to go back and tell my friends at youth group. I was more concerned with my duty as a Christian to share the gospel than whether or not anybody around me was coming to Christ. And what I learned through watching Paul interact in this passage was God began to reformat my way of thinking about evangelism. And I'm going to walk you through the process that took me five years to go through, and I'm going to do it in three questions. The first one is, are you listening to the Holy Spirit? Go back to verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. Well, why was his spirit stirred in him? I believe his spirit was stirred in him. It says, because of the idolatry. Well, why did the idolatry caused his spirit to stir. Well, because, see, Paul was the one that wrote in first, I think it's first Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. It's interesting. He wrote two-thirds of your New Testament, and in every book he's got, oh, and by the way, making mention of you in my prayers night and day. The cat prayed. He prayed hard. See, I don't think Paul had a discipline of prayer. I think he was so engaged in the mission that it drove him to his knees in prayer constantly. And when prayer in my life was nothing more than a checklist and a discipline, I didn't see power. When I engaged in mission and all of a sudden prayer became a necessity, then my heart started to be aligned with God. An example, real clear example, go back to Acts chapter 8. We see um, the story here of Philip. It says in Acts chapter 8, verse 26, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge over all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem to worship. And if you read on in the story, he's reading the book of Isaiah, and he's trying to figure out there's a lot of action going on here in uh, Jerusalem, and, and what's this all about? And this guy just got crucified, and I just can't figure any of this stuff out. And Philip is prompted by the Holy Spirit of God to go and talk to him and interpret Isaiah, the prophecies of Jesus Christ, that in fact the Messiah did come. And he's calling men to repentance, and he's calling men to, to salvation. And the eunuch gets saved and baptized right there on the side of the road. But see, that happened because Philip was what? He was in tune with the Holy Spirit of God. How do we get in tune with the Holy Spirit of God? Through prayer. Prayer is an absolute necessity. See, a lot of my evangelistic opportunities and effort was done out of what I thought the world around me needed rather than how God was working in the lives of those around me. Because, see, my view was here, but God was at work in these two guys over here. And I was not open to that because it was about duty. 
It was about me. So what is our mission? Why do we suck oxygen? Why are we here? Why did God leave us here? And if you watch the lives of Philip and Paul and all the apostles, it points you right back to Matthew chapter 28, 19, and 20. And we know this. This is the Great Commission. Go ye therefore and teach. Teach who? All nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Teaching them what? To observe all things, whithersoever I, who said that? Jesus, it's, it's the man Christ Jesus, I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. The Holy Ghost shows up 15 days later at Pentecost. Boom. The church explodes on planet Earth, and our mission is to tell all nations about it. Paul knew this. Paul understood this. Paul was connected to that Holy Spirit. And for that reason, it was prompted. You realize... It was never Paul's intention to go to Mars Hill. This just happened to him. This wasn't part of their agenda on missionary journey number two. This just happened. So what's the result of, of Paul's prompting? Verse 17 is the word therefore. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and Stoics encountered him. So he's meeting with the Jews in the synagogues. He's preaching to them Jesus with the devout Greeks who also followed God but weren't Jewish. And then with regular people like me in the marketplace, just going to the grocery store trying to buy stuff and stay alive. And, and then the Epicureans and the philosophers come and they want to talk to him. And what's interesting is the speech that we're given here in Acts chapter 17 is his specific address to at Mars Hill. So we're not privy to the conversations that he had over here in the synagogue or with the devout or with the uh, average person in the marketplace. But what I can glean for this is my second question for you. Do you understand who you're talking to? Do you really understand who you're talking to? And this is something that God started to work in my life and I realized at UMKC, there are a lot of people here from a lot of different countries. And there are a lot of people here from a lot of different backgrounds. And there are a lot of people here that believe a lot of different things about God and the Bible. And there is no way I can come up with a canned approach that just gives everybody the gospel. Notice how Paul deals with this. Verse 18. Uh, we'll jump down to verse 19. And they took him and brought him unto Oropagus, saying... May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. Jump down to verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. And it's funny that he uses that word superstitious because that implies something. That implies worldview. Because Paul's attitude was, look, I understand that you guys speak Greek, but I'm going to do one I'm going to do one more thing. I'm not only going to meet you in language, I'm going to meet you in worldview. And that's one thing that God had to teach me. I'm not just interested in Andy and you going out and articulating the gospel. You need to understand where people are coming from. The thing that I had to learn was I grew up in church. I have what's called a Judeo-Christian worldview. And when I, when I was interacting with the outside world, I was very critical, very critical of their sin very critical of the way they viewed the world, very critical of that. So I threw up all of these roadblocks that they had to overcome in order to hear the gospel. Paul doesn't do any of that. It's interesting, in what we read, Paul never brings up the fact that they're polytheists. Paul never brings up the fact that the Epicureans and the Stoics' view of purpose was wrong. All he does was articulate through a way they would understand who God is, who Jesus is, and what that means to you personally. Paul was a master at this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 16, you can go there if you want, but I'll read it for you. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. 17, for if I do this thing willingly... I have a reward, but if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily that I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. 
For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. Verse 20, and unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, he lived as without law, being not without law to God, but under law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things that I might by all means save some. And I realized that my approach was very self-centered. And it's interesting. I went to engineering school and the two guys that came to Christ were engineers. The people in my life that I impact on a daily basis are people in my immediate circle. People that I spend every day with. Because see, what these guys were interested in is Andy preaches a lot. But how does Andy handle it when he gets an F on a test? How does Andy handle it when the girl he asked out said no? How does Andy handle it when uh, he's thrown in this situation where this girl wants to sleep with him? How does Andy handle it where we're at a party and we're going to do some recreational drugs? How's Andy going to handle it? They had to watch me for four and a half years before in their mind, okay, I think this is legit. Because see, I had a shotgun approach where I love going down to Westport and talking to drunk people and catching them when they come out of the club. I love that. We used to, on Fridays, we used to go in the lunchroom just right there at UMKC and try to drum up spiritual conversations. And that was fun. But I realized sharing the gospel is not about having fun. Sharing the gospel is our mission. Paul understood the people that he was dealing with. The third question I want to ask you is what are these people rejecting? What are people rejecting? In verse 31 of Acts 17, it says, Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given them assurance unto all, and that he raised him from the dead. And Paul is talking about Jesus. Verse 32, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And others said, we will hear again of this matter. Some mocked. But what did they reject? They rejected the resurrection. They didn't reject Paul because he was a jerk, like I was rejected for being a jerk. They didn't reject Paul because he was critical of their polytheistic worldview, like Andy was critical of their postmodern or naturalistic worldviews. They rejected only the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the gospel. I remember having a conversation with one of my friends, and he was Muslim, and uh, he never wanted to talk about Jesus because, see, Muslims view Jesus very differently than the Christians view Jesus. We both recognize he existed, he was a good man, but See, we put him on the throne as the son of God. Muslims don't put him on the throne as the son of God. And he was close enough in my life. I remember I used to love, his family was Muslim, so I used to love going over to his house, especially during Ramadan, because, see, they couldn't eat until sundown, but I could, and his mom loved cooking for me, and so I'd show up, and his brothers and him would be across the table, and I could eat all the food in front of them. It was glorious. <laughs> and they didn't like me, but his mom loved me, so it was all good. And then they would depart to the different parts of their house to go pray. None of it weirded me out. He would come over to my house. My mom would cook for him. We had a really, we had a fun time together as friends in college. But he never wanted to talk about Jesus. And I noticed later on when he did come to Christ that it kind of needed to be that way. He kind of needed to have no reason but Jesus to reject and I remember having a conversation with him. And he goes, I don't know if I can become a Christian. He was crying. And I said, is it because your family will reject you? He says, yeah. I said, yeah, that's the cost. God calls us to die. You try telling that to a Muslim you're not friends with. And tell me how far you get. What are people rejecting? See, what I learned from Paul here is Paul was not 
he wasn't disgusted by their polytheism. How many people have I turned off in my life because I was disgusted by their sin? See, I had to not be disgusted by the gay guys in the locker room hitting on me. I had to not be disgusted by the girl in my class who just had an abortion. I had to not be disgusted by the guy on the sex offender list because he's a pedophile. Because you can't reach anybody you're disgusted by. And thank God, Jesus is not disgusted by you. When I learned that, see, Jesus had this thing where he would walk into a room and the Pharisee would pull stunts like put a woman who was caught in adultery totally humiliated in front of everybody and say, what should we do with her? And he turns around and he levels the playing field and says, okay, if you haven't sinned, throw a stone. And they had to walk away. And then on the Sermon on the Mount, he shows up and he turns to the Pharisees and says, you know, you guys are all high and mighty because you haven't cheated on your wife. But I tell you, if you thought about another woman, it's the exact same thing. And then he goes and preaches the Sermon on the Mount. He levels the playing field. See, I didn't do that. I had a hierarchy of sin in my mind. As long as I was above this line, I'm good. Never found that line in the Bible, ever. And God took that line and shoved it back in my face and says, if I haven't rejected him, who are you? What are they rejecting? I want to leave you with something that I call the five P's of missional living. Go to Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. And this is where I realized that evangelism in my life could no longer just be an activity. This had to be a lifestyle. This had to be something different in my life. So go to Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. Says the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. And I realized I wasn't operating wise. So this is something that I totally stole from another. Um, I got this from a conference I was at uh, about five or six years ago, but it's really worked well. And it's it's a way of thinking about evangelism. It's a way of applying your life to the mission that I really believe is work in the social dynamics that we have in 21st century American culture. The first is prayer. And I've said this before, you can, what makes you think that your you know, evangelism tactic is so savvy that you don't need to be working where God's already working? Obviously, we have to be devoted to prayer. We have to be guided by the Spirit of God. We have to go where God is working. Because otherwise, it's inefficiency, isn't it? We're sharing the gospel where God's not even working. Maybe God's going to work in their life 30 years from now. But he's working over here. See, my Muslim friend was ready to hear about Jesus, not because I had all the cool arguments and everything, but no, he found out his fiance was cheating on him and his world was destroyed. Or my atheist friend that got married and started having kids and his whole life is, is so overwhelming, he's not sure what's going on because then the, the ground became fertile for the gospel. Prayer is essential. Number two is proximity proximity. It's really hard for me to share the gospel effectively with someone I'm not close with. Modern anthropologists describe 21st century American culture in three what they call spaces. We live at home, work, and what's called the third space. And the third space is a very interesting space because, and you can see it if you look at the history of sitcoms in the United States, it moved the areas where people made significant decisions about their life moved from the context of mom and dad in the house to the context of peer groups whom they lived with and around. And so some of your Catalyst um, sitcoms, um, Friends, um, and pretty much everything since then, <laughs> has all been in the context of friends and not the context of parents. Before then, growing up, it was like full house and family matters, right? It's moved. And it's impossible in my mind to really have an effective communication of the gospel if you're not in that proximity with them. 
if you don't live in that uh, space with them. Number three is proactivity or being proactive or what I call habitual blessing. This is something I always teach my students. I help teach uh, uh, college students at my church in Springfield and one thing that I always train them to do is habitual blessing. One of the things that I have them do when I first start teaching is you're going to write a letter to your biggest spiritual mentor, whoever that is, a pastor, a parent. It's got to be handwritten. You've got to send it in the mail. Now I want you to write a letter to someone outside of your spiritual circle, someone who needs Christ, and just tell them how much you appreciate their friendship and how much you love them. You know what happens within the church community when we get cards and letters and hugs and all that? We're a little bit used to that. We like it. You know, we like to give the hug back and thanks. Hey, this was really encouraging. This was awesome. You know what happens when you do that to the outside world? You gain an immediate friend that wants to be there forever. I can remember when Chris and I got married, we went to, a, there, was a, there was a guy across the street, him and his girlfriend lived there, or across the hallway, he lived in an apartment complex. And I went over there and I knocked on the door and I said, hey, you guys want to come over, we'll cook you dinner Thursday night. And he said, uh, yeah, that'd be awesome, we'd love to. So Thursday rolled around, I was getting up, I was leaving, I was going, for, going to work, and he ran out because we kind of left at the same time, and he said, hey, hey, uh, sorry man, my girlfriend got uh, really sick this week, and I'm kind of taking care of her, and we won't be able to make it tonight, I really apologize. I said, hey, no problem. So I go to work, on my way home, stop by Walgreens, get a get well card. Chris, does, Chris and I sign it, slide underneath the door. I get a knock at the door a little bit later, hey man, that was, that was, that was awesome, thank you. That was, that, was, that was cool. Then I get messages on Facebook. Hey, really, thank, you know, thanks for the card, blah, 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 blah. So we continue to invite them. They come over. They do dinner. The following week, we invite them again. They come over. They do dinner. They started having parties at their house just to have an excuse to invite us to stuff. So we started going over there. I hate hockey. I watch so many hockey games with this guy. <laughs> and be a Jew to the Jew. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I'm there, and, and we're hanging out, and, and we're, we're doing all this, and my, we'll have my small group come over to the house to do breakfast, and then they come over. They're the first ones there. They're the last ones to leave. And a little bit later, uh, we end up moving down to Springfield. We have a going-away party at my parents' house, and they show up, and they give me this plaque. It says, World's Best Neighbors. So I got it up, up in my office. They're the first ones, actually, to come down to Springfield and stay with us all from a get well card. My atheist friend invited him and his wife over to my house, my mom cooked dinner for him and then he invited me to his house and so I go over there and we would study and I would help him through the, the different classes and he was working full time and married and had family and, and he was under a lot more stress and, and pressure than I was and so I would help him out taking notes, helping him study, do all this type of stuff. He became pretty close to my family and we went to the Billy Graham crusade in 2004, and this is funny, we're sitting there, the invitation happens, and my mom just taps him on the shoulder and says, shouldn't you go down there? <laughs> like, mom, it took me four and a half years, and you're just gonna tell him to go down there. <laughs> and he went down there. <laughs> and he accepted Christ. You know, mom? <laughs> But that was the point, was we had proximity. There was persistence on my end. I was going to make you tell me no to being your friend. And see, what happens is you're close to somebody, and you spend time with that person. And then one day you get a phone call that says, hey, my mom's dying of cancer. Or this or that's happening. I remember going over to my, my buddy's house, his mom was going in, they weren't sure if she was going to make it, going in to, uh, to have surgery in a couple weeks, and I go in there, and uh, I'm a Christian guy, walking into a Muslim house, and they're fine with me praying over the family. Proactivity, proximity. The fourth is proclamation, to proclaim. It's not evangelism unless you articulate the gospel. Being close and having friends and having them around you and being really impressed that you're a really good guy does nothing for the gospel.
because all you communicate to them is, hey, you can be a good guy without Christ. See, you have to communicate the fact that Christ is why I live and am who I am and why anything is good at all in my life. And I can remember talking to my uh, Muslim friend, and one of the things that he told me that really impacted his life is a funny story. Um, in UMKC, and I was a little bit of a hippie, I had long hair and slept in the library and did stuff like that. And so my alarm goes off in the morning and I'm in the library and I wake up, you know, I'm nasty and I'm running through there because I'm a little bit late for class and this girl is carrying like 15 books, you know, just walking over about ready to go file them and I slam into her and the books go everywhere and this girl is drop dead gorgeous. And so I'm picking up all the books and everything and figuring out how I'm going to get her number and... And I give her back her books, and she's like, this is funny. This is, this is kind of like a scene out of a movie. And I said, yeah, and this is the part where I get your number. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad, right? Not bad. I was kind of proud of myself. I watch Hitch. And uh, <laughs> she gave me her number, and I practice proximity and proactivity. <laughs> so I called her. I called her a lot. She didn't, she didn't quite respond a lot, but I called her a lot. It had been a couple weeks or whatever, and she talked to me, you know, and I'm trying to figure out, you know, she's always kind of busy to hang out and all this type of stuff. And one night I call her up, and, and we're talking. I'm like, well, what, you, what do you have going on tonight? Me and my friends are going to hang out. And she says, well, uh, I'm actually making dinner for my boyfriend. <laughs> I was mad. <laughs> I wasn't mad. I was pissed. All right. This... I was angry. That night, I was like, we're going to West Park, and Andy is going to get in a fight. I don't care with who, but it's going to happen. <laughs> so I took off. I was a jerk to everybody. No one wanted to fight me, but I was, I was angry, and I didn't know how to express all that very healthy. And, and my buddy was there with me, and the next day, I called him up, and I said, hey, I need to apologize to you, because the way I behaved last night was not Christ-like. It wasn't right, and you suffered the bad end of that stick, and, and I'm sorry. He says, okay, well, you know, I forgive you, no big deal. And we went on with life. Years later, he told me that in the Muslim community, they never admit weakness. And for me to be proclaiming Christianity to him and still admit that I don't have it figured out meant more to him than most of what I said. Proximity, proactivity, proclamation, and the last is patience. Patience. When I was training in martial arts, my sensei would tell us stories. And uh, I remember the story. He says, there's, as the story goes, this young man approaches the sensei and says, Sensei, how long does it take to get a black belt? The sensei thought for a while and then responded, Well, on average, three to five years. And the young man said, Oh, you don't understand. I mean, I'll be good, I'll, I'll come all the time, I'll practice every day. And the sensei says, oh, well, in that case, 10 years. He says, no, sensei, you don't understand. If these doors here at the dojo are open, I will be here. I will wake up early, I will stay up late, I will read. My whole life will be about dedicating myself to this art. I will learn. And the sensei goes, oh, wow. Well, if you put it that way, 20 years. And the young man left frustrated. And since they never told us the point of any of these stories that he ever gave us, because he always, he's from an Eastern background, and so you learn it, and then you recall later in life these stories. And what I learned is you cannot and will never be able to shortcut God. Because, see, God may be at work in someone's life, but he may not be at work in their life for the next 15 years. And you're going to have to be okay with that. No method, no ploy will be able to shortcut God's timing. Works the same way in discipleship. We are so eager, we live in a culture so ready to get rid of time. Right? Get a six pack in three and a half weeks, lose 20 pounds in four hours. That's what we're indoctrinated with. We pay lots of money to make ourselves look young because we're afraid of aging. 
we're scared to death of time. We don't know what to do with it. We say dumb things like, well, I just don't have enough time. What does that mean? Everybody has the exact same time you do. Our concept there is weird. I remember it was after training, and, and Jeff Adams used to train in our dojo, and we were talking, and I was just talking about how all this stuff was going on in my life, and I was just overwhelmed, and all these trials, and I'm just really you know, asking God for patience, and really trying to learn patience, and all this type of stuff, and Jeff Adams turned to me and goes, well, that's your problem. Said, what do you mean that's my problem? He says, you're praying for patience. I said, of course I'm praying for patience. I'm going through all this stuff. He goes, patience is not a magic emotion, son. Patience is got through the fire. You learn patience by going through stuff. Stop praying for patience and your life will get better. <laughs> it's a weird thing for your pastor to tell you. And it was somewhat in jest, but his point was true. Patience is not a magic emotion. and We only get it through experience. In prayer, proximity, proactivity, proclamation, and patience, I believe will yield fruit. Because we live in an age where people are more interested in you understanding them, for good or for bad. I worked at UMKC as a recruiter, and it was my job to study the 18-year-old demographic in the United States. And the number one characteristic is they're the most narcissistic demographic in human history. They're the most narcissistic. In fact, narcissism is being taken out of the psychological handbook because it's no longer considered a disorder. Because when the majority of your population has narcissism, it's actually a disorder not to be narcissistic. And you're going to have to be okay with that. You're going to have to identify and know this is the world that we live in. And it's going to require dedication, concentration, and love on my end. Let's pray and you guys can get out of here. Dear Lord, we just love you. Thank you for uh, just the...